started. Now, today we'll talk about the individual well being of the EMT, but we're also going to talk about the well being of your partner because, as you know, in almost every permutation of EMS, you're working with at the very least one other person. It's pretty rare that an EMT is working alone. It's not unheard of, and it certainly is not something that certain industries don't normally use a, a single EMT or a single paramedic going out to uh, deal with stuff, but for the most part, it is going to be you and your partner. And if you're working for an agency like a fire department, then it would be you and your partner and everyone on your crew. So we need to think in those broad universal terms of first me, then you, then the bystanders, and then the patient. Okay, so let's walk through all the rest. Next, we're going to talk about personal protection and personal protection, especially in the days that we are recording this. It's August 2020, so we're pretty much in the uh, in the heavy throes of COVID-19 and all of its ravages. So this is pretty topical, but personal protection isn't just using the right equipment for the right job. It's also making sure that we have a good general mindset of uh, protection while we go through the call. Next, we'll talk about diseases of concern. And yes, don't worry, we're going to talk about COVID-19. If I didn't talk about it, it would just be completely worthless to you as an EMS professional or as someone that's training to become an EMS professional. Believe you me, COVID-19 is in every single aspect of what we do out on the ambulance or in a fire station or in a hospital setting. It's everywhere. Next, we'll talk about emotion and stress and the way that we can effectively deal with emotion and stress. And if you think that this is the job that benefits the individual that just internalizes everything and doesn't share how they're feeling, I'm going to tell you right now that you're wrong. We are moving away from the tough individual uh, approach to the job and we're really trying to encourage our first responders to spend more time talking about what is actually on their mind because you see stressful things and we're going to be talking about that throughout the class. I'm a very big advocate of uh, mental health, of taking care of yourself and dealing with emotions and stress and for anyone out there that is uh, you know a returning professional or you're just looking to brush up on your skills, if you don't think that this job will affect your mental well-being, I really, really do want to urge you to, you know, maybe reach out and talk to somebody because if you've been doing it for any period of time, especially in the 911 setting, but, you know, still in the inner facility or IFT setting, it can be very stressful. So, you know, but I don't want to get too far off base here. Finally, we'll talk about scene safety and scene safety if you are a little bit further along in the course materials, you already know that that is something that we talk about literally on every call. Scene safety is something that we need to constantly reassess. We have some great ways to really size the scene up and look for scene safety, but it's something that doesn't end until the very last bit of the call, until we turn over care to the hospital to the higher medical authority, scene safety is never a given. It's never it's never something that is just okay to not think about. We need to constantly be on our guard. But without much further ado, let's dive into these topics. Now, as I said before, we're gonna start talking first about well-being, and this is gonna be on the individual basis, but this is something that you should think about if you notice someone that you work with if they are not dealing with the stress or the, uh, the, the unique aspects of being in EMS. You know, as EMTs, we're uh, known as mandated reporters. It's a legal term. It means that we are legally mandated to let authorities know if we think that someone wants to hurt themselves, hurt others, or if they are so unable to take care of themselves that they will literally die on their own. That's the... Uh, aspect of being a mandated reporter that we deal with when it comes to self-harm and harming others. And of course, we also have to report if we think someone's being abused, whether they are a minor or an adult or in our geriatric population, all the way at the very oldest of our patients. So well-being is not just something that we want to think about for ourselves, but obviously for our patients. But today we are going to be focusing on the individual. So here we go. As an EMT, you need to understand that the risks are very real. You can contract a disease. You can contract a bacterial or viral infection. You can be injured in an accident. You can be injured by a violent patient. You can be 
shot, you can be stabbed, you can be blown up. And I don't want to say this to scare you. I certainly don't want you to think that it's like going into a war zone. It's not. But working as an EMT is inherently dangerous because people don't call us when they're having a great day. They don't call 911 and say, hey, guys, uh, no problems here. Just uh, wanted to let you know that, you know, everything's working out, turning this life around and everything's good. No, they call when they're at the lowest point. They call when they're sick, when they're hurt. They're, they're going to call when they are not having a good day. People don't call 911 because they're having a good day. So understand that when you go into that environment and you're dealing with emergency situations, you're dealing with someone that is desperate for help. So we need to be very cognizant of that as we go in. So scene safety, again, is something that we think about all the time. Now, the next aspect of well-being and scene safety really comes back down to your ability to do the job. As I've told my students in class already, if you are hurt, if you are sick or hurt or incapacitated in any way, your patient will not get the care that they have been asking for. As a matter of fact, it's not very uncommon that if you are hurt, the responding agencies that are coming to help out are going to take care of you first. It's that concept of family. It's that concept of you and I don't know each other, but we do the same job. So it's very common to see uh, an ambulance get into a, an accident. It's almost always the, the very first priority to look at the EMTs and the paramedics because it's just human nature. You feel this drive to take care of that person that you feel like you could call a family member. Now that may or may not be right. I'm not going to sit here and have a moral discussion about it, but I will say this. It definitely delays patient care. However you chop it up, it doesn't matter if those responding agencies go directly to the care of your patient and they ignore you entirely. I mean, that'd be kind of messed up, but probably, you know, not going to be what happens. But if it did, then you already know that you're delaying care. You're not getting them to the hospital. You're not initiating different aspects of your assessment. You're not starting any interventions. So if we think about scene safety as not only being for our well-being, if we take a bit of a more selfless approach and we think also about the well-being of our patients, then scene safety does really become the overarching umbrella in which we need to approach every call, which is if the scene is unsafe and we can't do our job, then we need to make the scene safe. So let's let's uh, let's pause on making the scene safe and let's talk a little bit of, a little bit more about the individual EMT. Now, how do we maintain well-being? Well, you know, good personal habits are super important. Now, I teach to high school EMT students, but I know that EMT is taken at all different ages. As a matter of fact, you know, we've already expanded the ability to offer this to younger and younger students, but I've seen students as old as in their 40s and 50s. A student that is already well into their adult life has a better idea of maintaining that well-being, whereas a student that's 16, 17, or 18 years old may not have established those healthy lifestyle choices. But remember, it is important to understand that this is something that we can build throughout our career and certainly throughout our lives. So how do we maintain well-being? We have to have those solid personal relationships, that person that we can vent to, that person that we can just call and say, I had a bad day. They don't even need to know what's going on. They can just sit there and say, I hear you, dude. I hear you, friend, whatever the case may be. Exercise. Exercise is huge, huge, huge to all of us in EMS. Now, I know that of the individual responding agencies, the police department, the fire department, and EMS. EMS is probably one of the least well taken care of in terms of personal health and exercise. I see it all the time. And, uh, you know, it, it's just kind of endemic of the way that we do our jobs. You'll see that EMT that eats every single meal at a 7-Eleven, or you know that crew that combined they are already clocking in over 600 pounds. You can see the ambulance start to sink in the front when they hop in at the beginning of shift. And I don't want to throw shade on anybody. I don't want anyone to feel bad. But being overweight is certainly going to affect your ability to do the job. Being unhealthy and out of shape is going to affect the way that you do your job. Extrapolate that, you know, move on down the line. If we are Impaired in the way that we can do our job, we are denying or delaying patient care, and now we are effectively hurting the patient 
more so than helping them. So exercise is hugely important. Plus, you're going to have most uh, most agencies or companies that want to hire you. They're going to want to see that you are physically capable of doing this. So we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about proper lifting techniques and so on and so forth. But I want you to keep something in mind. Most gurneys weigh anywhere from 120 to 165 pounds dead empty. No patient, no equipment. 120 to 165 pounds. Granted, most gurneys now have an electric button to, have, to help them go up and down, but not all of them, and electronics fail. If you are not capable of lifting with assistance 125 to 165 pounds, you're going to have to get there. And unfortunately, in my time as a training officer, I had to fail a lot of employees uh, and, and you know probationary employees because they were not able to physically lift their patient. If you can't lift your patient, you can't do the job. Moving forward, sleep. Now, sleep, again, is something that is unique to EMS. We are the one service between the fire, the fire service, police, and uh, law enforcement, and EMS that probably gets the least amount of sleep. Now, I don't want to sit here and say, oh, we get the least amount of sleep. Our life is so hard. What I'm trying to say is that very frequently, EMTs will be deployed out on ambulances and they will spend an entire 24 hour shift in said ambulance. It's not necessarily the best way to do things, but that's the way that we do things out and about. And you'll see these EMTs that will routinely go for the better part of their 24 hour shift, either sleeping in the front seat of an ambulance or barely staying awake because they can't sleep like that. Now, if you're on a if you're on a 24 and you have a station, that's great until calls come in and the you know in the middle of the night. Sleep is unbelievably important, and we're doing more and more studies to find out ways that we can better serve our EMTs, firefighters, and police officers with sleep. And I also want to throw in our nurses and doctors because sleep deprivation also affects them. If sleep is something that you are lacking and you think that you can operate indefinitely without it, I'm here to tell you that that's incorrect. And many of the preventable accidents that we see in EMS have something to do with sleep deprivation or exhaustion. Unfortunately, it just hasn't really changed because we're trying to find the best ways to do the job and allow you to sleep, and we haven't really found an elegant solution yet. So moving forward, eating right. That one's pretty simple. Like I said, we've got that 600-pound uh, crew it's eating out of uh, 7-Eleven and Del Taco and McDonald McDonald's and Carl's Jr. and you name it every day. And that's just not the way that we want to, you know, really treat our bodies. So what you put in is what you get out. You got to try to make conscious decisions about eating healthy. It doesn't mean that you need to go and find a salad at every single restaurant that you go to or every single fast food place that you go to. But a little bit of planning, meal prep is the best way that you can guarantee that you eat the right way on the ambulance. Moving forward, limiting alcohol and caffeine intake. Now, for my high school students, uh, the amount of alcohol that you should be consuming is zero because you're under the age of 21, which is the legal age to drink in the United States. So I don't wanna spend too much time on that, but obviously alcohol has negative effects on our health and on our ability to do the job. And of course, you would never show up to work uh, under the influence of alcohol. So we really want to you know, stress to my older listeners, my older viewers, if you are drinking um, noticeably more after you start your job as an EMT, uh, you may need to, you know, have a conversation with yourself, dial it back a little bit, and maybe try to find alternative ways to, you know, beat stress. Because all of these bad behaviors that we're talking about, poor eating, poor or, uh, you know, completely non-existent exercise, um, really having poor personal relationships or detonating these personal relationships, consuming drugs and alcohol, a lot of it really all comes back to one fancy word, which is stress. It's not all that fancy, is it? We talk about stress all the time, but these behaviors are as a reaction to stressors. And the job itself is already very stressful. So we don't want to self-medicate or cover up that stress. We really need to try to focus on our mental health and talk those things through. What I know my students are going to use on a regular basis is caffeine. Uh, I am certainly not one to stand on the pulpit, slam my hand down and say, no more caffeine. 
I ingest a lot of caffeine too. It's something that I'm working on. But if you are at the point that you are consuming 300, 600, 900 plus milligrams of caffeine per day, that's going to have a negative effect on your body. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to start to really hurt you in ways that you can't see or feel now, but in 15, 20 years, you'll be able to tell. So caffeine intake is something that we definitely want to really monitor carefully and closely. And then finally, seeing your physician, seeing your doctor is going to make sure that you are keeping that healthy mentality throughout your career. And then obviously using your vaccines. Now I wanna go ahead and I wanna put this out there real quick and real early because there are 39 individual videos for each, uh, for each of the chapters that we have. And uh, I wanna let you know something right now, just so that there's no confusion. I believe in vaccines. I think the vaccines are great. And if you would like to debate me or you know, spend any time talking about the efficacy of vaccines, I'm more than happy to do so. But vaccines are not a government ploy to control us. They're not implanting chips in our eyeballs and they are not trying to poison us slowly. Vaccines are important. We need them. There's just no other way around it. So you really wanna have that good working relationship with your physician because as a patient of his, his goal or her goal is going to be, how can I make sure that this individual can go out and lead a healthy lifestyle? And if you're not telling them, hey, I'm working as an EMT, they're probably not going to be, uh, you know, really understanding of why you're starting to put on extra weight, why you're not sleeping very well, why you are starting to show signs of hypertension or, uh, or, or any of the other negative aspects of just not taking care of yourself. So very, very important overall that we think about ourselves because we need to treat our ability to go out and do the job as a specific tool. If you have a tool that is poorly maintained, left out and not taken care of, eventually it's gonna fail and it's either going to fail in a place where you need it and you don't have it, or it's going to fail in a way that's going to hurt you or hurt whatever you're working on. So we need to think of ourselves as an extension of those tools that we have on the ambulance. And if we're not taking care of ourselves, we're really going to end up being very, uh, you know, very hamstrung. We're not going to be able to do our job very well. Okay, moving on. All right, that was a very long dive into the well-being of the EMT. I promise this is going to start going faster. So now that we've talked about how you can take care of yourself and really put yourself in a good position to go about doing the job, we need to talk about what kind of equipment is present and available for you to safely do that job. So personal protection really is a set of equipment, but it's also a mindset. And we're going to talk about that mindset through the concept of standard precautions. What are standard precautions? Well, pretty simple. Standard precautions are the steps that we take with every patient, as well as the kind of steps that we would decide to take based on information that we receive on the way to the call, as well as when we are approaching the patient. Basically, what we're saying is, there is no reason for us to wear every single piece of protective equipment on every call. However, we do need to take the opportunity, use critical thinking, and look at the presentation of the patient to decide what precautions and what protective equipment is best to use. But that's a whole lot to use, and it's a whole lot to really come up with off to the side. So I've got a quick little thing that I learned when I was a brand new EMT. What is it? Well, simple. If it's wet, sticky, and not yours, don't touch it. It's a very simple concept. And another very good way for you to go about doing your day-to-day -day job is imagine to yourself that everyone has something that you don't want. And just pushing out a little bit further, that you may have something that no one else wants. If we go about our job and really our day-to-day -day life imagining that, we can really eliminate a lot of the risk that is involved in doing this type of patient care. So again, if it's wet, sticky, and not yours, don't touch it. Or alternatively, imagine that everyone has something that you don't want and you don't want to get other people sick. Moving forward. How are standard precautions, how is personal protective equipment, how is all of this stuff 
standardized. Of course, we're going into a business that is largely run by government agencies. Now, government agencies are, uh, they're, they're usually going to be the individuals that set the standards that really are the guidelines for everything that we do. We have government agencies that say how we can drive our ambulance and what kind of an ambulance is correct and what isn't and how we can do our job and what equipment we can carry and what we can't. And of course, any job that has inherent danger, which really is any job, has mandates to make that place safer. So let's talk about the first government agency that we're really gonna be involved with right off the bat, it's OSHA. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration is really going to be the overarching agency that tells you how to do your job as safely as possible. If you're new to the workplace, OSHA may not be something that you're very familiar with. If you're old hack and you've been uh, working around really in any job setting, you've most likely heard of OSHA. So what does OSHA do? They really set guidelines for the best way for us to do our job. And because we work in healthcare, it also uh, issues strict guidelines on uh, how to prevent exposure to bloodborne and airborne pathogens. Now, because we are in the throes of COVID-19, we also have to think about droplet exposure. So do be sure to check out the individual PowerPoint that I'll be putting up on OSHA mandates and OSHA safety. For my students, that'll be a certificate class. For the rest of you, it'll just be a, a nice little refresher on safety, but we won't be going real deep into all of those aspects today. It'll be a very cursory overview. Really, at the end of the day, OSHA may set the standards, but your local agencies and your company, they are going to be the ones that make sure that those standards are held to the highest degree. And eventually, if uh, you do something wrong, they'll be the ones that met out punishment or retrain you, whatever the case may be. So always, always, always refer to what your local agency says is appropriate and effective. Know what your training officer is telling you to do and understand that while one department or one agency or one company does it one way, it may not be the same across the board. But especially when it comes to precautions for airborne droplet, uh, bloodborne exposure, it's all pretty simple. Um, we, we really just want to try to avoid any kind of undue exposure to you and we want to make sure that you are able to do the job as safely as possible. Okay. Real simply, when in doubt, put it on. When in doubt, put on that PPE, that personal protective equipment. So what kind of personal protective equipment can we anticipate to see in the field? Well, here's a great way for us to introduce you to it. So I'm going to start from the top left. I'll move across from left to right, and then I'll do the bottom row. Up at the top, you see splash-resistant goggles. Now, these goggles are basically safety glasses. If you've ever worked around uh, any kind of manufacturing, if you've ever worked in an area or uh, in a setting where there's a risk for splash, especially chemical splashes, you've seen these before. These are not your standard glasses. So if you're looking at this thinking, oh, I already wear glasses, I'm covered. Congratulations, you're wrong. <laughs> I, I feel you, I wear glasses too, and then I gotta put these big bulky things over my other glasses, it's a pain in the neck, and I feel like I'm a thousand years old trying to read out of bifocals that don't work anymore, but that's the way that it is, and I would rather be safe than be comfortable. Next, we have our N95 mask. Now, our N95 mask that we see here on the top is similar to the one on the bottom, but there are different uh, individual types. And again, we'll be talking about that more during the OSHA lecture. So be sure to stay tuned for that. On the right, we have a pair of gloves that are actually a bit different than the ones below. The gloves that are on the right are likely going to be a sterile set of gloves. Now, in a hospital setting, in a clinical setting, sterile gloves are usually done by size, and usually you already know what size you are. There's an entire procedure for taking them on, or for, for putting them on and taking them off. Um, but in our setting, in EMS, there's really only one place where you will find sterile gloves. That is in our emergency childbirth kit or our obstetrics kit. The reason that we have those sterile gloves, well, we're going to be touching a brand new baby boy or girl. And we want to make sure that we don't have the same old nasty gloves on that we walked into the house wearing. Now, let's move on down to the bottom row. We have a surgical face shield 
and mass combo. This is a bit more common nowadays, especially with COVID-19, but what this does is it helps eliminate some of the risk, not all, but some of the risk of uh, splashes and airborne droplets being, uh, being absorbed in the mucosal membranes of the eyes and, uh, and really, uh, hopefully, keeping them off of the face entirely. But really, we're just trying to protect your eyes. The surgical mask below, that is really going to be there to protect you from large droplets, but it's not as effective as the N95. One thing that we have seen since the, uh, the emergence of COVID-19 are hospitals and uh, other pre-hospital agencies that are requiring their, uh, their end users to wear both an N95 and then on front of that, a, uh, an additional surgical mask. Uh, there's, there are plenty of studies that say that that's effective or that's more effective. I haven't really seen anything that, that makes that, uh, that argument in a very strong fashion. So if you have seen something, I'd love to see it. So go ahead and share that in the comments down below or send it to me uh, in the classroom if you're one of my students. But it does seem like it's a bit overkill because the N95 is designed to not only filter out the air that you're breathing in, but also eliminate the possibility of airborne droplets or from aerosolized or, um, or airborne um, individual particulates leaving the mask. And those studies are very, very clear. Now the N95 is a special mask and I'm talking about it again because we're back down on that center mask. The N95 is special because it filters, it filters particulates down to a size of 0.3 microns in non-oily environments. If we have an oily environment, uh, we can use an N or a P100, and we have other masks that we can use. But these N95s are definitely in short supply. They're only being used by essential healthcare. Uh, Read EMT, EMR. Those are essential healthcare workers. So you will be learning how to uh, put these on and take them off, or as I said before, donning and doffing. Finally, we have our standard nitro gloves. Now, nitro gloves are replacing latex gloves because of latex allergies, both for the uh, end user and for the patient. And nitrile is the, the, next, uh, the next permutation of what those gloves really are. They're great gloves, they're, they're stretchy enough, and they do a very good job of keeping you safe. Now, what we don't have pictured here is additional equipment. We have gowns, we have boot covers, we have head covers. There are entire sets of PPE that we won't even get in, into in this class because it's not really going to be at the level where you'll be at the end. And those would be for individuals that are on specialized response teams. Those would be for individuals that work in a hazmat environment. Those would be for individuals that are working in a very highly isolated environment and they need to have complete protection. So we won't be talking about that, but we will, uh, we will be glazing or uh, really spending a little bit of time with it. And then we'll, uh, we'll put up some supplemental videos so that you can see what those look like and how they operate. Now, let's start with the very first line of defense, gloves. You should always have vinyl or non-latex gloves. Like I said, nitrile, that's spelled N-I-T. R-I-L-E, nitro gloves, those always need to be available. Gloves need to be changed not only in between every patient that you deal with, and this will become even more important when we start talking about mass casualty incidents, but they also need to be changed regularly throughout the transport. If you wear your gloves from the moment that you go into a home, a healthcare facility, or walk up to your patient on the call, and the next time that you take them off is when you're handing over patient care, think of all the surfaces that you've had to touch you have touched most of the gurney, the doors on the ambulance, you've touched equipment in the back, you've touched the walls, you've touched the side rails, you've touched your tablet, you've probably touched some type of a stylus or pen, you may have even touched your phone or another device, and you've definitely touched all the equipment in the back. Now, I'm not saying that it's you know something that we don't do, that we don't wipe down all those surfaces, but if you think about it for a moment, if you take your gloves off to write something on your tablet, that seems like a better way for us to deal with the possibility of cross-contamination, not only from the patient to us, but also from us to other healthcare providers, to the nurse and doctor that are gonna be taking over care, or, and God forbid, to one other patient. So it's super important. I take the time during my class to sit down and go through an average call. On average, the EMT in the back, the attendant, 
will go through about six to seven pairs of gloves. So we'll break that down a little bit later when we do our skills video on donning and doffing protective equipment because there is a special way for us to do this. But think about that for a second. And then I want you to think, well, you know, Eric, I don't want to spend all that money or I don't want to waste all that, uh, you know, equipment and gloves. You're not wasting it. Don't think of putting on multiple pairs of gloves during a call as being a waste of personal protective equipment. Think of it as being a way for us to limit liability, not only for patient's health and our health, but for the individual agency or company that you work for. Because when people get sick and die, when people get so sick that they have to leave work, when people get COVID-19 because they've been serving on an ambulance, that ultimately costs the company money. And I can guarantee you that those are more expensive than a couple pairs of nitro gloves, guaranteed. And I would be more than happy to sit down with any representative from any company and explain that to them because I do know what the cost of gloves is. But off my soapbox, moving on. Now, what you see here is proper doffing or proper removal of nitro gloves. It's not a very effective picture and the video that I'll be putting up as well will have a little bit more to explain so that you understand the process. But what you can see here is that the provider is removing their gloves and it looks like they're putting them in a red bagged container. These are known as biohazard bags. Down to the bottom left of the picture, you can also see a plastic case. That's a sharps case. I'm going to tell you right now, if you put anything into a red box or a red bag, it needs to be contaminated with biohazardous materials. What are biohazardous materials? Sputum, vomit, saliva, um, mucosal, uh, mucosal anything, so snot or anything like that blood, feces, urine, semen, uh, breast milk, vaginal secretions, anything that is wet, sticky, and not yours is considered to be biohazardous. This isn't the trash can where we put everything. This is just the trash can that we put soiled material. And of course, the hard case that you see down there is only for sharps. So don't be caught shoving your gloves in there or some random nonsense. It's for sharp materials like lancets from our glucometer sets or from spent IV catheters, whatever the case may be. Moving forward. Hand cleaning, more so than gloves, is going to be the number one way for us to effectively reduce the risk of really contracting most of the diseases, viral infections, and bacterial infections that are out there. So how do we effectively wash our hands? Honestly, if you have been in a coma since January of 2020, you've just woken up and somehow you enrolled in my class and you're like, hey, I don't even know what COVID-19 is. I'm going to tell you something right now. Hand washing is not something that's difficult. Using warm water and soap and washing for at least 20 to 30 seconds is the best way for us to eliminate the risk of contracting diseases, viruses, and bacterial infections when we are doing our job. Now, that isn't necessarily going to be something that we have at all times. We don't have a sink in the back of our ambulance. It's not like an RV. So what we do have are alcohol-based hand cleaners. Now, when is it okay to use uh, an alcohol-based cleaner versus using a, uh, a sink with soap and water? Well, it's super easy. If your hands are visibly dirty, if you can look down at your hands and you see that there's dirt or grime or something disgusting on them, you must wash your hands as soon as possible in a sink. If you look at your hands and there's really no uh, visible dirt, there's no visible grime, there's really nothing there that would say, well, my hands are dirty, but you want to make sure that they're clean, an alcohol-based hand cleaner is acceptable, okay? So alcohol-based hand sanitizers can be used in the absence of soap and water, but soap and water are going to be the penultimate way for you to clean your hands. And I would say that if you're working in a clinical setting, you should be washing your hands enough to the point that you're considering using lotion. And if you're working on an ambulance, you should wash your hands every single time you have the ability to do so. When is that? We show up at the hospital with our patient. As soon as we hand over patient care, you wash your hands. We go out to the ambulance, we clean the gurney, we do all of that. If we have time, we go back in, we wash our hands. Once we go to the station, hey, I've just been inside of an ambulance, literally a rolling cesspool of disease and death. I wash my hands. Prepping food at the station, wash your hands. About to eat food at the station, you wash your hands. Am I making it clear? 
you need to wash your hands like a lot, a lot, a lot. If you can say in your mind, I know when I last washed my hands and it was within the last hour, you're probably pretty safe. If you have to think for more than five seconds about the last time you washed your hand, it's been too long. Go wash your hands. All right. Soapbox over. Let's move. Now, you can see here, this is normal hand washing behavior. This is normal hand washing etiquette. Soap, warm water, it doesn't need to be scalding. We're not trying to kill anything that's on there with hot water. And just hint, you'll burn your hands before you get water that's hot enough to kill some of the stuff that we come in contact with. So just use warm water. It just helps break up the dirt a little bit easier. That's all. That's the only reason. Soap, warm water, 20 to 30 seconds, preferably 30. Next, we have a picture of our individual um, uh, alcohol-based hand sanitizer. It may be it, it may be advertised as uh, antibacterial. It may be just alcohol-based. Really, what they're saying is that it kills most bacteria on contact. But the thing to remember about these is that they won't kill some of the more stubborn viruses. So it won't necessarily kill something like C. diff. It won't kill something like um, that's, and this is, this is where I get a little bit, a little nervous, but we don't have strong evidence that these hand sanitizers effectively kill all of COVID-19. It's just too new of a virus to know. So in a pinch, it's a great way to keep your hands clean, but there's already a problem with this picture. And I'm going to ask you guys to mention in the comments down below what that problem is. But I want you to look at the way that this is being stored and the way that the provider is using it to get the soap out, okay? So go ahead and comment down below on why this is wrong. Moving forward. Eye and face protection. Now we talked about goggles and we talked about face and splash shields. What we're really trying to do is we're trying to keep any kind of fluid from entering the body, and specifically through the nose, the mouth, and the mucosal membranes of the eyes, okay? You need to have a guard on the front and the sides to have effective eye and face protection. So you should have a specific, uh, industry specific eye protection. And if you don't have one of those available and all that you have is a splash guard, you may need to withdraw and uh, you know have someone else with that effective eye protection go and do something. Now, this is gonna keep you safe during really specific procedures like uh, as an EMT, assisting with endotracheal intubation or any placement of an advanced airway, suctioning of a patient's airway, utilizing a bag valve mask and any kind of basic airway adjunct. This is going to protect you from those things that can be uh, popped in your face. Some less common uh, applications, if you're dealing with somebody that has just been uh, sprayed with tear gas, mace, or OC spray because they cough, they spit, they do a lot of that. And moving forward, really anyone that's coughing, sneezing, or spitting, those should be the patients that we wear eye and face protection on because that's our most vulnerable area. You know, that and uh, and broken skin is going to be our biggest concern. But we'll talk more about broken skin later. And remember, most of the concern is on our hands, okay? Now, this EMT is wearing a combination of an N95 mask, and these are the duckbill N95 masks. Some industries, are, I'm sorry, some agencies use them. Our industry certainly does. But what you more commonly see are the masks that were in the slide earlier. She's also wearing a pair of effective industry standard eye protection. She has protection from the sides and the top, and of course, from the front. This individual EMT looks like she's getting ready to do something regarding the patient's airway, whether that be placement of an airway adjunct, whether it's basic or advanced, bagging the patient, suctioning the patient, or generally dealing with someone that is coughing, sneezing, spitting and really just making droplet and aerosolized um, uh, virus contagions in our environment. Moving forward. Masks. Now, we've talked about this uh, a little bit and I will do a separate video on how to put these masks on. We'll also be talking about fit testing so that you know that it's not one size fits all. N95s are not, uh, they're not made like that. You have to have the right size. But when should you wear masks? Well, right now, because we're in the middle of a pandemic, really masks are gonna be worn on pretty much every single patient interaction that you go out on. Because uh, especially where I teach, 
And where I work, there are we are uh, considered a hot spot. We're uh, one of the hottest spots in the United States, unfortunately, at this time. So for the most part, you're going to be wearing an N95 at the very least on every call. But under normal circumstances, when we're not in the middle of a worldwide pandemic, masks would be worn whenever we would expect blood or fluid splatter or any kind of airborne or droplet-based um, virus or bacterial or disease type of infection risk, okay? So right now, the N95 is really what you're going to be wearing, and the N95 is a respirator. It's a non-powered respirator. It is going to filter the air that you breathe based on the size and the, um, the not just the size, but also the collection, as it were, of the fiber material, so how tightly it's woven together. Now, N95 masks are great for providers, but because they're in such short supply, we really aren't going to be issuing any N95s out. In years past, I've told my students, if you have a patient that's very, very immunosuppressed, um, you know, they're taking, um, they're taking drugs for HIV or AIDS, they are on chemotherapy treatment, we'll go ahead and we'll put, uh, or if they have tuberculosis, we'll put an N95 on them. Uh, that is no longer true because they are so in such short supply that we're only placing them on ourselves. So N95 or mask, N95 masks, or uh, depending on your agency and uh, a P100 are going to be mandatory for any patient that may have COVID-19. And because of where we work again, is going to be every patient as well as other equipment based on compliant, uh, complaint and presentation. Now, what does that mean? If we have a patient that we think might have COVID-19, fever, uh, coughing, loss of taste, things like that, well, we'll go ahead and we'll, uh, we'll put N95 masks on. But as I said before, we're pretty much wearing them on every call. However, if the patient is actively coughing, sneezing, or has some type of uh, mucus or, or blood coming out of, their, out of their mouth and nose, then we need to take other precautions. We need to have eye, eye protection. We need to have some type of a gown or, uh, gown or um, a replaceable disposable suit. We also need to have boot covers. Now, this is definitely going to be agency specific. And I want to tell you right now that if you feel like you're just the biggest jerk in the world for putting all this stuff and you feel like you're making your patient feel bad or whatever, tell them this. I, I'm really sorry. I don't mean to make you feel bad. I work on an ambulance around sick people all the time and I really don't want to get you sick. So it's not you, it's me. And yes, that is totally cliche, but it's a great way to put patients' fears at rest. And right now, honestly, seeing people walk into your house in moon suits is not that uncommon when you call for 911. That's just the way that it is. That's our reality. Next. What you can see here is a provider that is, under normal circumstances, wearing an appropriate amount of PPE. But I want you to look at this, and I want you to tell me why, in the comments below, this is problematic. This provider is suctioning a patient's mouth. It looks like the patient is vomited and it looks like they are using all the right equipment. But think about the way that it is presented and look at the mask and the face shield and tell me where this person is not protected. Like I said, down in the comments below. Now, gowns can be worn to protect clothing uh, as well as bare skin, but really it's to keep as much of that gross nasty stuff off of our uniforms as possible. Now, when you go work for your agency, they will have very specific instructions on how to wash your uniforms, especially nowadays. So make sure that you follow those, uh, those recommendations. And if you have a company or an agency that does the laundry for you, then make sure that you have additional uniforms that are uh, ready to rock and roll just in case yours becomes soiled. So we've talked about some equipment, and I, as I've said before, this is a very brief overview of the kind of personal protective equipment that we wear. And remember that personal protective equipment is a bit of an umbrella term. For the most part, when we talk about PPE, we're talking about things to keep us safe from biologic threats. However, we have other protective equipment that we wear, such as helmets, brush jackets, and bunker jackets, pants, boots, uh, any kind of ballistic or body armor, and so on and so forth. And we'll talk about that more in other chapters. But 
the overarching theme is always going to be your safety above all else. So let's talk about some of these diseases that we're really concerned about. Why are we wearing gloves on every patient? Why are we wearing these N95 masks all the time? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Well, it's because of these specific diseases. So I know that you know this, we're already gonna talk about COVID-19, don't worry, it's in there. But I want to start with the more common diseases that we're concerned about. Now, hepatitis B and C. Hepatitis B and C cause inflammation of the liver. These individual um, viruses can live on surfaces of dry blood for up to seven days. So they're very, very, very hardy viruses. They are not easily killed. So that's something that's very important to remember. Now, next, what I want you to understand is that hepatitis B has a vaccine. Hepatitis C does not. Now, hepatitis B itself is very deadly. It will kill hundreds of people even nowadays, but because the vaccine is so widely available and because as a healthcare worker, your, your individual agency, your company is required to offer you a hepatitis B vaccine free of charge every time you go to a new employer, then you should have the hepatitis B vaccine at the very least by the time you start working. If you don't have the hepatitis B vaccine or if you uh, aren't sure about vaccine efficacy, uh, I would love to share with you some of the side effects of hepatitis B, which is a disease that will eventually kill you. So just something to think about. Hepatitis C, unfortunately, no vaccine, but it poses the same risk. And really the big problem with hepatitis, especially with hepatitis C, B, and C, is the kind of damage that it does to the liver. Now, there are two pretty common ways that the liver is uh, really broken down in, in, in you know, any part of the world. It's going to be hepatitis B and C and alcoholism or uh, alcohol, um, alcohol related cirrhosis. Liver disease itself is rough. Liver disease as a healthcare worker is even more rough. And anyone that has liver disease has to join a long, long, long list of other people that are waiting for livers as well. You only have one and it's a pretty effective filter. And when you lose it, you're gonna have a bad day. So I would highly recommend that if you're on the fence about vaccines or you know, you're, uh, you're listening to Alex Jones or whatever and you think that vaccines will turn you into a frog or whatever he says, I don't know, then you might wanna do a little bit more research beyond Facebook because vaccines are effective and they're really worthwhile. Like I said, I'm not gonna sit here and have a whole comment war down on vaccines because there's just, there's, there's no way to defend your position. Anyway, moving forward. Tuberculosis. Now, tuberculosis is different than hepatitis because hepatitis is a bloodborne virus. Bloodborne. Tuberculosis, on the other hand, is an airborne virus. This is a virus that is, or I'm sorry, tuberculosis as itself is a uh, airborne disease and it affects the lungs. It's highly, highly contagious and in the past has caused major and uh, really detrimental loss because of uh, really a very limited ability to treat it. Tuberculosis nowadays is a lot less scary because we don't have nearly as many cases. Uh, and you know, just with the advances in healthcare and vaccines and, uh, and early determination, tuberculosis doesn't really uh, have very many outbreaks in the United States. However, tuberculosis outbreaks in other parts of the world are common. Here's what you need to know about tuberculosis. If your patient is coughing, period, the end, they need to be masked. If they are wearing a mask, guess what? You're wearing a mask too. The patient will wear a surgical mask. You will wear an N95. The reason? That will help limit the droplet exposure that you may get from tuberculosis. The N95 will guarantee that you won't also in, uh, encounter the airborne aspect. Okay, so droplet and airborne are different. So we're done with tuberculosis. Now we're gonna talk about HIV and AIDS. What are HIV and AIDS? And, and this is gonna be important because there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of bad information out there. So I really wanna talk about what the differences are. So HIV is human immunodeficiency virus. It is a viral infection that attacks the body's immune system. And once presented in the body, uh, really just goes everywhere. So HIV is what we hear a lot about, but it really doesn't always lead to AIDS. 
AIDS, on the other hand, is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So HIV is a virus. AIDS is really a set of conditions from the immune system being compromised. HIV is really going to be found through bloodborne pathogens. It can be um, it, it can be from sharing dirty needles. It can be from unprotected sex. It can be from an unscreened blood transfusion. But we don't really see very many cases of HIV where the patient wasn't really in, in some type of risky behavior. However, we do have healthcare workers that may contract HIV because of a dirty needle stick or because of exposure to bloodborne pathogens. And that's why having the proper protective equipment for these kinds of calls, especially when blood is being coughed, spit, vomited, or sprayed about, why we need to have goggles and masks and gowns and things of that nature. So it's just important that we understand that HIV and AIDS, these are completely preventable using the right equipment and really HIV should stay HIV because HIV itself can be treated by uh, these antiviral drugs that are available throughout the world. The number of patients contracting HIV throughout the world has really fallen pretty significantly in the past couple of decades, and the number of AIDS patients that we see have also fallen pretty significantly. But that's the other misconception. HIV does not lead to AIDS. If you get HIV, you won't necessarily get AIDS, and you don't need, you don't need to have HIV to get AIDS. So what is AIDS? AIDS, again, is a set of conditions. and. Um, so really what AIDS is, is your body being repeatedly affected by the same, the same infection, the same thing over and over and over. This would be recurrent bouts of pneumonia, um, Sarkozy sarcoma. This would be things that would eventually lead the patient to die. I mean, and AIDS itself is really just a description of a patient that is so immune compromised that their body is very rapidly shutting down. And as I've said before, HIV can be treated to a point where with drugs, it is uh, not completely eradicated from the system, but it won't necessarily progress to AIDS. HIV in the 80s and 90s was considered a death sentence. And uh, many, uh, unfortunately, many people were unable to or unwilling to receive care because HIV was pretty commonly referred to as a uh, as a disease that affected homosexual men. Now, we've come a long way as a society, and we understand that is not true, that HIV can be contracted through a number of different, uh, a number of different venues, but we've also expanded our knowledge and understanding of the disease itself, and we found drugs that can very effectively treat HIV to the point where, under certain uh, circumstances, it can be completely or nearly undetectable in blood samples. Now, we don't have a cure for HIV. However, I do think that we are getting much closer, and it is important to remember that as healthcare professionals, our constant access to patients that are sick and, and don't necessarily have all of their medical records ready to go, these are going to put us in direct, in direct contact with someone that may have AIDS, or I'm sorry, may have HIV. So it's important to remember that, again, if it's wet, sticky, and not yours, don't touch it. Now, AIDS itself is really going to be kind of a rarity, especially where we work here in the United States. Um, but there is a much lower risk than contracting uh, HIV than for hepatitis or tuberculosis. For uh, just quick reference, the hepatitis B virus can survive in a puddle of dried blood for up to seven days, whereas a strain of HIV will only survive for a number of hours outside of the body. And if there's any rapid fluctuation of heat or cold in temperature, the virus will die. It's a very, very fragile virus. Let's talk about some other numbers. If you are stuck with a dirty needle with a patient that has hepatitis B and you don't have the vaccine, you are at risk for a range of 10 to 30% chance of contracting hepatitis B. On the other hand, with HIV, a dirty needle stick will be less than 0.5%. So just so that we can be clear on the numbers, HIV is much less virulent and much less dangerous to healthcare providers than hepatitis B, but I guarantee 
the one thing that you have on your mind if you have a dirty needle stick isn't, I hope I don't get hepatitis, it's, I hope I don't get HIV. But thankfully, we have drugs for both. Hepatitis B can be treated in a vaccine form so that we can, uh, we can help your body resist the ability for it to take over. And with HIV, if you do have a dirty needle stick, we can start you on um, retroactive drugs right away that will actually kill the virus. But it's all about timing. We have to do it right away. Next, novel coronavirus, also known as COVID-19. Recently discovered in Wuhan province, China in late 2019. The coronavirus itself is spread primarily by droplets, but it may be airborne. Again, because COVID-19 is so new, this is unverified as of the time that I'm recording, which is uh, mid-August 2020. It causes many negative effects, but it primarily affects your respiratory tree, meaning that COVID-19 is going to have a number of different uh, negative effects on the body, but really where we see the most problems is with the respiratory tract and respiratory tree, as well as the prominence of cases of pneumonia and other things that would affect the ability of the individual patient to breathe on their own. Okay, There are other aspects that haven't been pu publicly verified. Uh, we're still trying to find out, and when I say publicly verified, I mean I don't have anything that is set in stone. But we've heard that COVID-19 can be contracted through a number of different uh, venues. And we've talked uh, at length in the news and throughout the last six to eight months about how it affects all, seemingly all parts of the body. There are some very promising studies on the effect that it has on the brain, the effect that it has on the digestive and uh, gastrointestinal tract, as well as the effect that it has on the um, on the vasculature, the blood vessels, the arteries, the veins, the capillaries, and blood itself. So because COVID-19 is so new, so, so very new, we know very little about it, but we do know that it primarily affects the respiratory tract. Because of its new emergence, we're really going to have to learn about this together. So if you're in my class, we'll talk about COVID a lot, I guarantee it. And if you're not in my class, I promise I will put up supplementary videos so that we could talk a little bit about COVID-19 and try to dispel some of the rumors. So that's what I have to say about COVID-19. And I also want to remind you that COVID-19 patients are difficult to necessarily identify in the field. However, because where we work is considered a, uh, a hotspot, a new zone of rapid infection rates, uh, ra rapidly rising infection rates, uh, most of our patients, if uh, feeling ill at all, will be, uh, will be treated as if they are possibly COVID-19 positive, and we will take all the necessary precautions. N95s on all the providers, a surgical mask on the patient, isolation, uh, isolation precautions taken throughout the transport, and uh, special ambulance entrances for possible COVID-19 rule out. Now, some emerging conditions are are going to be something that we want to talk about a little bit more and of course this slide needs to be updated on a regular basis so i spent a little bit of time kind of cleaning things up one of the emerging conditions that we've seen recently is ebola back in 2014 uh, we had a very very small scale uh, scare about a possible pandemic uh, ebola was primarily affecting people on the african continent and uh we were very concerned that those individuals would uh, bring their infection here to the United States. It really ended up, uh, you know, not being nearly as bad, but uh, I mean, compared to COVID-19, it was, you know, it, it was a drop in the bucket, but we do want to talk about what this is. Now, Ebola itself is not a new disease. We've known about it since the 50s. It causes a hemorrhagic fever, and because of the high rate of deaths, the very, very high rate of deaths and lack of definitive treatment, we looked at it from an EMS perspective as a possibility for being a, a massive, massive undertaking for our treatment protocols and the way that we would deal with it. Ebola is the reason that at least where I worked here in the county that I teach in, that we started the Infectious Diseases Response Team. And I was fortunate enough to be able to serve on that. But we never transported a single Ebola patient. And a lot of those lessons that we learned, we either translated into the way that we're dealing with COVID or we rapidly implemented because they were already in place. 
Now, I'm not going to say that Ebola and COVID are the same. They're not. However, it was because of this resurgence in 2014 that really caused reconsideration of how we deal with protocol for infectious diseases. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has proved to really show that those preparations were far, far too small. Other emergent conditions are uh, ones that if you were not uh, around in the field or uh, really alive at this time, they weren't really on your radar. SARS and MERS. These came out in the early 2000s. SARS is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, it's very similar, just like MERS is to COVID-19. It's spread through respiratory droplets, and SARS was primarily found in China. However, China was able to get a lot of this tamped down, and SARS really didn't become a concern here in the United States. Same thing with Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS. It was found primarily in the Arabian Peninsula, and uh, it is often compared to COVID-19 in research settings, just like SARS. But really, the reason that these were uh, very localized was because their governments took very aggressive measures to quarantine and isolate patients that were found to be positive. We had very, very few cases here in the United States compared to where these originated in China and in the Middle East. Uh, with corona, with uh, corona, excuse me, not just coronavirus, because of COVID-19, we know that uh, there, there, are, there, there are some similarities, but COVID-19 has obviously taken much more aggressive uh, stance here in the United States. Avian flu, found in poultry, it can affect humans, but it's not easily transmissible from human to human. So we don't see a lot of avian flu and we definitely don't see large outbreaks. We typically see it with people that are dealing with or are around large bird populations. And then of course, influenza. We can't go through this without talking about influenza. It's been around for hundreds of years. We had the Spanish flu or the 1918 flu back in, uh, 1918, which killed around 30 to 50 million people. And that same flu strain is being compared to the way that uh, we're dealing with COVID-19 today. We are, um, we are approaching a time in our history as humans that we will see how influenza will affect COVID-19. We were fortunate here in the United States to really beat out the majority of the flu season without large numbers of COVID patients, really without any. However, we're approaching that time where flu season begins again, October, November, and usually runs through uh, February or March. We'll see how that affects our treatment and, uh, and, and overall recovery rate of COVID-19 patients. But as of the time of this PowerPoint presentation, we don't have that information, so we'll have to wait and see. Now, infection control itself is, is an important concept to be constantly aware of, and I think that most people are hyper aware of infection control. We've learned about new concepts like uh, social distancing. We've talked about different aspects of infection control like uh, contact tracing and quarantine, whether it be individual or self-quarantine or large-scale stay-at-home quarantine. But overall, as EMS personnel, we are at very high risk for coming in contact with infectious diseases. That's why we have guidelines that are set forth by OSHA and really set in place by our employer and our local agencies. So these infection control systems do a couple of things. They identify potentially dangerous infections and infection, uh, uh, infection concerns. They identify the appropriate deployment of personal protective equipment to deal with these concerns, and they deal with the procedures for treating the original patient, identifying and notifying EMS and other healthcare personnel if they've been exposed, and eventually trying to contact anyone else that they may have come in contact with before they were aware that they had been exposed or may be uh, potentially sick. We'll do additional training for personal protective for COVID-19 because eventually we would like to try to get all of our students out into the field for ride-alongs during the 2021 winter to spring season. But we also want to make sure that before you go out into your workplace that you are a hyper-aware, hyper-prepared EMT that understands the dangers of COVID-19. For these programs to be effective, we need to have 
a joint responsibility placed on the employer and the employee, as well as effective control at the state and local level. EMS agencies will take all of this in by providing training, protective uh, personal protective equipment, vaccinations free of charge to their employees. The employees will take part by ensuring that they follow the policies and protocols set forth by their company or agency. And the state's and local agency's responsibility will be to go through and confirm that this is in fact happening at a company-wide level through audits, through normal training, through updates. Finally, employees that are uh, thinking about their own personal safety and the safety of the people that they serve will participate in the infection exposure control plan, meaning that they can be contacted at any given time based on their treatment of a patient. There are very strict rules on, uh, on, on patient confidentiality, and we'll talk about HIPAA later on, but the thing that you need to understand is that through specific legislati legislative acts, the individual healthcare worker has a right to know if they have been infected. And that can be either be voluntarily provided by the patient, their family, or their uh, whoever their designated agent is, or they can be uh, they can be compelled through a legal order. And in my experience, the individuals that don't want to expose that part of their medical history, the uh, the compulsion from the courts are uh, swift and almost always in the favor of the healthcare provider. So basically, if we don't have the ability to confirm that the patient does or does not have this virus, this disease, this viral infection, this bacterial infection, whatever the case may be, uh, more than likely, we'll just go ahead and start you on prophylactics or on drugs that can retroactively um, start to fight against what whatever may have been given to you. So, these controls are really done through a number of different systems. Infection exposure control plans are especially important for 911 providers, but of course for anyone that is providing any kind of EMS services. Education and training, and that's something that's done on hire and uh, throughout the time that you work for the agency or company. Vaccinations like hepatitis B, the issuance of personal protective equipment, discussing and training on methods of control, regular and daily housekeeping, labeling of potentially infectious products, as well as products that can deal with uh, infectious materials for the purposes of decontamination, and then of course, post-exposure evaluation and follow-up. Earlier, we talked about legislative measures that were taken. So EMS providers, pre-hospital care providers, really first responders in general could, uh, could be safer. And the Ryan White Care Act is really one of those major pieces of legislation. The Ryan White Care Act allows EMS providers to find out if they've been exposed to some type of life-threatening disease or virus or bacteria while they were providing patient care. It also has some pretty strict standards on HIPAA and patient privacy, but we'll talk more about that when we get into legal and ethical issues in EMS. The individual that's going to alert is going to be a designated officer from the hospital and then another designated officer will start to gather information about those potential exposures, whether or not it was a confirmed exposure or uh, if the person even got sick. Now, there are two different systems so that we can keep these threats separate. There is the airborne disease exposure system and the bloodborne and other infectious disease exposure system. We're in the process of creating a completely separate system for COVID-19, and uh, that is certainly a work in progress, but right now it's really all being reported under Ryan White Care. So once you find out that you've been exposed, your employer will refer you to a healthcare professional so that you can do an eval and follow up and see if there's any particular uh, reason to start retroactive uh, treatment using antivirals or antibacterials, whatever the case may be. It's really important to understand that because we are in the middle of a pandemic, not the middle or the end, but uh, you know, in the beginning, we're still trying to figure out how to best implement these uh, components with regards to how COVID-19 works. Now, there are other systems besides what we just talked about with uh, with airborne and bloodborne. Uh, we have specific programs like the tuberculosis compliance mandate. This is something that we're trying to do on a regular basis because tuberculosis as a 
uh, as, as a disease is incredibly infectious and is very difficult to tamp down uh, when we have individuals that have it. So uh, because of its incredibly infectious nature, we have a completely separate program. Just like I was stating before, COVID-19 will probably have a completely separate program after and probably well after we've developed a vaccine or even after we've developed uh, what could be construed as a cure. Because as always, unless every single person on planet Earth has been inoculated, there's still chances that people can get them. And there's really very few diseases that we've completely inoculated against. So back to what we're talking about here, tuberculosis compliance is just like COVID compliance. If you feel that your patient may have coronavirus or tuberculosis or any other airborne or droplet-based uh, disease, virus, or bacteria, you, the provider, will wear an N95 or HEPA mask. Your patient, on the other hand, will wear a surgical mask. Now, the surgical mask will keep them from spreading all of the, uh, the droplets, but it won't protect people around them from airborne based particulates so that's uh that is kind of the 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 trade-off when we have a patient that has an airborne disease and as i stated before covid19 has not been conclusively proven to be airborne but we have some concerns that it might be so we're doing our very best to understand and better treat these these patients and of course maintain the high level of care that they've been getting before these n95 masks will be gone into much more detail in other videos um, we're going to do an entire video so that you can see how to properly uh, don and doff them, as I had stated before. But they really are going to be a very common part of your, uh, of your duties as an EMT during this pandemic. But some other opportunities for you to don an N95 would be if you're transporting uh, your, your, your patient in a closed vehicle, which is every ambulance. And... Of course, we have ways to filter out air, but it's much less effective than wearing a mask. And then, of course, certain procedures, such as assisting with endotracheal suctioning and intubation, or a patient that is coughing or sneezing in the ambulance during transport. Immunizations, as a uh, completely different aspect of protection, will give you the opportunity to stay safe just by the marvels of medicine. As we discussed earlier, hepatitis B is an immunization that healthcare providers must offer to their employees free of charge anytime that they are onboarded. So once you start, you have to be offered the hepatitis B vaccine for free. If not, they are not compliant with federal mandates. There's other uh, immunizations depending on where you work. Of course, if you work in an area where a vaccine uh, is is uh, being tested as a first responder, you may end up finding that you will be asked to uh, be part of the test group. We're seeing that uh, as, as uh, recently as this morning with healthcare providers and military uh, members in Russia. Uh, Russia claims to have found an effective COVID-19 vaccine. So they're rolling that out right now. But there are so many different vaccines that are out there. The majority of them are already going to be covered by the vaccines you've received as a child. In addition to all of that, yearly tuberculosis testing will be required at the very least here where I uh, teach and within the state that I teach in, in California. So it is a pretty common uh, aspect of any healthcare setting to get regular TB testing. And because it is done on a yearly basis, you'll have a robust record of any tuberculosis strains, and it's much easier for you to track them using healthcare, profi uh, healthcare professionals and healthcare providers. It makes it much easier to do contact tracing because usually healthcare providers will be some of the earliest cases of tuberculosis because they'll be in close contact in a closed setting with that patient. Moving away from disease and viruses and bacteria, we get back into the mental health aspect of being an EMT. Because we're showing up again on some of these people's worst days, we're going to deal with a lot of emotion and stress internally and externally. It's a very common occurrence that your patient confide things in you that they wouldn't confide in some of their closest family members because you are operating in a, in a position where you'll see them in a very vulnerable state. 
and that can really weigh on you after a while. So emotion and stress is certainly a big aspect of being able to effectively do your job and understanding that not only uh, are you going to be expected to deal with your own emotions and stress, but the emotions and stress of others. The physiologic aspects of stress are pretty well documented. Increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, and of course because of increased blood pressure and increased uh, heart rate, that can lead to issues later on with the cardiovascular system. But because there's a physiologic aspect of stress, it's best that our EMTs uh, and paramedics and first responders in general understand the signs of stress and start developing strategies early in their career so that they are able to navigate some of the more stressful calls that they'll see. Now, the physiologic aspects that I wanted to talk about today are going to be fight or flight and uh, the, the aspects that are very animalistic. So the first stage is fight or flight, that alarm reaction. The second stage is the stage of resistance or coping. This is uh, after the call is over, there's clearly no danger, there's clearly no threat. And then, of course, the third stage, exhaustion, where the individual loses the ability to adapt or resist that stressor. They have a, a moment or a complete inability over, over a period of time to continue dealing with that stress. In EMS, we call this burnout. And burnout can be because of a lot of different uh, aspects of care. But for many providers, a lot of it has to do with the fact that they see a lot of death and destruction. They see a lot of really troubling things. The type of stress reactions that we want to try to avoid are the ones that are destructive, the ones that are going to make your life difficult or cause you to lose your your job or ruin a relationship or turn to destructive behaviors such as use of alcohol and drugs. But stress reactions may occur especially during critical incidents. Critical incidents such as incidents that involve small children, incidents that involve violent crime, large-scale incidents like uh, terrorism or natural disasters, and so on. Acute stress reactions are often linked to massive catastrophe, but we do see a high number of EMTs dealing with this on a regular basis. Acute stress meaning that it's accumulated over time. The signs and symptoms won't necessarily develop right away. That'll be something that's a bit more insidious. You'll see that this starts to affect their, their personal lives and their, and their professional lives. And we see a number of different parts of this in the physical, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral symptoms that are exhibited by the EMT. These are very normal reactions, but they may require professional intervention. Now, we're not saying that if you have a bad call and you just can't get it out of your head that you can't be an EMT anymore, far from it. What we're trying to say is that we would rather you see and, and seek out professional help rather than try to cope on your own or self-medicate or do other more damaging things to try to cope. Delayed stress reaction is something that in, ends up being much further down the line. This is more commonly referred to as post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. And no, PTSD is not something that you can only get if you've uh, experienced someone losing their life in front of you or if you've taken a life. It's not something that you can only experience if you've been you know, locked up in a basement for 14 years. Post-traumatic stress disorder can come from many different aspects of stressful and, and very stressful situations. The signs and symptoms really don't become evident until further along, and then you'll start to see that post-traumatic stress can follow, and, and often does follow, acute stressors. Delaying the, the treatment and dealing with the reaction actually makes PTSD even worse, and unfortunately, the patient might not even recognize what is causing that problem. PTSD really ends up being something that needs to be dealt with by a professional. Of course, you'll have the folks that are very, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, you know, do the things you need to do and, you know, suck it up and don't worry about it. But really, PTSD is something that, especially in the last 15 to 20 years, we've become very, very aware of in EMS and in different facets of first responder work, whether it be the fire service or law enforcement. We deal with very stressful situations on a regular basis, and 
up until recently, it's been one of the things that we've uh, kind of shamelessly just uh, swept under the rug. But that's not the way that we're really dealing with it anymore. We have systems in place to make sure that you don't need to just take all of that stress and just force it right down into your stomach until it becomes a cancerous lump. Now we have different ways to deal with it. And these different types of stress reactions all lead to the same end point, which is help. The last is cumulative stress reaction. This is as a result of years of sustained low-level stressors, whether that be um, the inability to sleep or a very busy schedule or, or even, you know, just a not, not seriously uh, acute stressors, but basically very, uh, very small incidents that compound over time. Uh, this is just like the, the old saying of a death by a thousand cuts. Not one of those cuts is going to cause you to bleed to death, but those tiny, tiny little cuts, all of those cumulatively, you know, over time will end up becoming what kills you. Now, early signs of cumulative stress reactions are vague anxiety, emotional exhaustion, basically being able or being unable to deal with things in your professional and personal life, lashing out at loved ones, feeling like you don't have anyone that understands you, and taking basically a very negative approach to the way that you do the job. It can even progress into physical complaints or uh, loss of complete control of your emotions, irritability, and depression. On the end of suicidal thoughts, we, we do see that there is a renewed push for the health and well-being, the mental health and well-being of our first responders. But we still have a pretty large stigma in EMS that seeking out help means that you can't do the job. We deal with individuals that are having psychiatric emergencies or emotional emergencies on a regular basis. And because of the way that our industry and our profession has formed itself, it has very, for a very long time, been considered a point of weakness. We're only recently coming around to the idea that it's not a sign of weakness. It's just a sign of being a human. And frankly, I'd be a little bit concerned about someone that doesn't take some of this stress and internalize it and, and feels like none of this affects them. I think they, they have a name for that. Uh, oh, you're a sociopath. That's right. <laughs> so you don't want to be a sociopath. That's, that's bad. I almost said that's crazy, but you know, you already get it. So cumulative stress reactions, acute stress reactions, and obviously delayed stress reactions can all be present in our EMS providers. But the willingness to reach out for professional help and the resources that are now being made available to you will definitely change your career for the better. So what are some of the causes of these, of these stressors? We talked about them a little bit. Mass casualty incidents or MCIs, calls that involve in infants or children, severe injuries, abuse, neglect, death of a coworker. These are all very common causes of stress. Now, all stress isn't bad. Stress is important. I, I had a biology teacher that once told us, if you don't have stress, you will literally die. And I suppose that's a bit of a, that, that's a bit of an extreme approach, but they were correct. You stress is positive stress. This would be the kind of stress that helps you work under pressure, helps you respond effectively. Forms of you stress would be things like, I want to get more in shape because I'm being pestered by uh, by a friend and they're they're you know teasing me about uh, about not being as strong as they are or another one that I know my students are definitely on top of is a deadline to turn in a homework assignment by 11:59 p.m. on a Sunday that they didn't start until oh 9 p.m. on that Sunday. Those are positive forms of stress or you stress. Distress is negative. Negative stress that causes immediate and long-term health problems with you and your personal health and well-being. Negative stress would be seeing things at work that are, for lack of a better word, distressing. Death of uh, infants and small children, mass casualty incidents, patients that are mangled beyond all repair, patients that have been involved in an accident that was as a result of violence. And of course, seeing a coworker or another first responder hurt or, God forbid, killed in the line of duty. 
Some signs and symptoms of stress are important to understand. Irritability, the inability to concentrate, changes in your daily activities or the loss of interest in the things that you enjoyed before, anxiety, indecisiveness, guilt, self-isolation, loss of interest in work, and uh, overall withdrawing from the things that defined you are excellent examples of signs and symptoms of stress. However, dealing with stress is a much different part of the job. Dealing with stress can be done through a number of different things. Changing uh, lifestyle, such as uh, promoting a more healthy and positive dietary habit, exercise, devoting time to relaxation and meditation, even changing shifts or locations for a different call volume, different call types, more family time. You may even find that the particular brand of EMS that you're working in, whether it be 911 or inter-facility transport, is causing you stress because it simply is not what you want to do. The beauty of being an EMT and working in EMS means that you can take your skills and apply them in a number of different avenues and aspects of the job. Now, what we just discussed and, and some of those coping mechanisms, those are things that you can do on a personal level. However, you're going to find that some calls are not just going to be distressing to you. As I said before, calls involving infants and children, especially children that are in cardiac arrest or are the victims of abuse or neglect or violence. These are going to be immediate triggers for uh, critical incident stress management, known as CISM, or a critical incident stress debriefing, or CS CISD. These CISM and CISD mandates are comprehensive systems that are developed by, psych by psychiatrists, psychologists, and mental health professionals to help include education, resources, and coping mechanisms to deal with stress after a, a particularly stressful event. These CISM and CISD mandates came out uh, fairly recently within the last 15 to 20 years, but they have done amazing work at changing the culture of taking all of our internal stress and keeping it there or taking all the stress that we deal with from specific call types and shoving it down into that part of your belly that turns into cancer. Jokingly, I'm just making a joke. But critical incident stress management and these CISDs are, help to, are designed to help responders diffuse after an incident. So with teams of peer counselors, mental health professionals, they come in and they meet with the rescuers and they go through the motions of understanding and explaining what was seen. I've been to several of these and, you know, I've seen them from anywhere from being a tense standoff between uh, my, my co-workers and I and the mental health professionals that they brought in and, and really not getting anywhere. And I've seen them as effective as people walked out feeling better. But overall, they help responders deal with stress and they help the agencies or companies out there make sure that the mental health of their EMTs and paramedics are being attended to. Dealing with stress, use, utilizing all of these uh, aspects of critical incident stress management and debriefings, they're great, but you have to understand that the job that you do is unique. We as humans are not designed to see a large number of people dead in our lifetime. There's a, there are several studies that show that the number of dead people the average human should see is much less than uh, double digits. We're talking single digits, five or six. It's average for the EMS professional to see that in the period of a couple of months, or if you're working in a particularly busy city, maybe even in an entire shift. But in addition to seeing these, these people in states of death, we also are there to witness when they die. It's really one of the most difficult parts of our job. And dealing with family members and people that are not in the same industry can be very difficult. You can almost feel resentful towards them because you feel that the burden that you hold is greater than can be understood by them because they simply don't have a frame of reference. Now, I think most people that are in, enrolled in the course or have an interest in medicine know about the five stages of grieving or the five stages of grief. The emotional stages are denial, 
anger, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance. And it's not necessarily going to be in that order, but that is a more common hierarchy of the way that people deal with uh, death, dying, and severe acute stress. Now, we've talked about the way that we as healthcare providers, we as first responders deal with things, but we also have to understand that we are in a, in a place where we bear witness to people dealing with severe emotional moments, with, with moments that will truly stick with them for the rest of their lives. And these stages can be difficult to witness as a provider. Understanding that the loved ones of the patient that just died will go through some of these stages. They may not go through them all rapid fire, but you'll have to deal with patients, family members that are in denial, that are angry, that are bargaining, or are immediately falling into depression. Very rarely do we see that come full circle where they come to accept what has happened. But being a caring, compassionate provider means that we will stand there and act as an individual to help them try to process the grief that they're feeling. I've said this in many of my classes and I've told it to, to a lot of brand new EMTs as a training officer. Sometimes the best care that you'll provide in any given situation is holding someone's hand, is literally giving them a shoulder on which to cry, giving them an opportunity to express their grief in whatever stage they're in, whether it be denial or anger or bargaining or depression. But that is what separates average mediocre EMTs from really, really good EMTs. And remember, EMT is a stepping stone. It's not an end career choice. It means that you'll be a much better paramedic, a much better nurse, physician's assistant, nurse practitioner, doctor, law enforcement officer, firefighter, you name it. EMT is a springboard into so many different careers. It will always lead back to you being a better fill in the blank because those jobs that we just talked about, they require compassion. All right. Understanding that stress and understanding your job to somewhat bear witness is also important because you are going to end up being sometimes the target of some of their anger. You don't need to tell them lies. It's okay to tell a family that they are not going to see their family member again. It's okay to offer comfort without lying. I hear a lot of people ask, how do you tell someone that their family member isn't going to make it? Or they ask, hey, how are they doing? I always shy away from using phrases like, well, it's not so good because that's not a great way to respond. They're going to get upset. And I always uh, move away from lying to them. Everything's going to be okay because when they're not, they are going to be upset. They're going to feel lied to. And of course, it's not your responsibility to be brutally honest with them, but you do want to be empathetic. What I like to say is we're doing everything that we can. I like to explain to them what we're doing. We're utilizing the monitor here and we're utilizing electrical therapy to try to restart the heart. The medications that we're using will also hopefully help us do that. We're giving your, your, uh, your family member this medication or we're doing this intervention. As long as you don't make false promises, you don't lie through your teeth, or go so brutally honest that they start throwing punches, you're in a good space. Because at the end of the day, are we lying? No, of course we're trying to do everything that we can. Are we doing anything that's untoward? No, no. Just because in our minds we feel that the patient isn't going to make it, we don't need to share that. And I'd like to tell you right now, I've thought that on plenty of occasions, to be wildly surprised weeks later when I found out from the doctor that, hey, the patient survived and walked out of the hospital. There's no better feeling. But you have to understand that we walk a very fine line as, as EMTs, as paramedics, as first responders, and we are asked to do an increasingly 
large amount of jobs. We aren't just providing medical care, we're providing emotional care. We're not just providing medical and emotional care, now we're also trying to provide preventative care. We're not just doing emotional and medical and preventative care, now we're trying to provide education. The job gets bigger every single year and the stress of that can be unbelievable. However, we have so many different great programs for dealing with stress that there's really no excuse to act like you don't have an outlet, especially in modern EMS. Let's talk about our final topic, scene safety. Now scene safety really is uh, the most important topic of what we're talking about today. And it really is, again, an umbrella term as to what we've discussed over the entire PowerPoint. Scene safety, is something that we need to take into consideration every single time that we show up. Now, this slide, I keep this part in because I think it's great. According to the publishers, according to the authors, EMS is not usually a dangerous profession. Well, I, I suppose I can agree with that. I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't had to start carrying a gun to work, and no one is actively trying to kill me on most days, but I would say that EM, EMS is a profoundly dangerous profession considering what we're doing. We are responding to calls with lights and sirens. We are basically requesting the right of way on red lights and in oncoming traffic. We respond regardless of the weather. We're up 24 hours a day sometimes. We are working in less than pristine environments and we're responding to anything from a elderly patient that has fallen down and has a bruised hip or someone that simply has gotten out of bed and they can't get back in to calls where active violence is occurring, where someone is actively trying to injure or kill us. So EMS is a dangerous profession. With that being said, having your head on a swivel and thinking about scene safety every single time that you come on scene is going to keep you in EMS longer than anything. Determining scene safety is one of the most important parts of the call and remember that scene safety is taken into consideration throughout the call. The moment that we start responding, scene safety is on our mind. We're thinking about what the call information is, we're trying to think about the location, the time of day, and if you're in my class we've already talked about the acronym PENMAN. And we're using PENMAN as we arrive on scene to do our size up and again consider safety. Safety isn't just going to be looking for a knife-wielding psychopath that's waving it around in traffic and trying to stab anybody that gets within swinging distance. It can be the unseen hazards as well, like hazmat incidents. Hazmat incidents are certainly not as common as violence and, uh, and criminal behavior, but they pose a very specific threat because much of the hazmat incident is unseen danger. The primary role when responding to a hazmat incident is to maintain a safe distance and attempt to safely identify the material. In every ambulance in the state of California, we are required to have the ERG or Emergency Response Guidebook. I say in the state of California, even though it is a federal mandate, because other states may have additional documentation and additional equipment inside of your glove compartment. Nowadays, because we have so many digital devices, that ERG is usually uploaded to the Toughbook or to your, uh, to your iPad or tablet device, so you can pull it up right there. The purpose of the ERG is to help identify based off of placards and based off of other indicators and how far we should uh, clear out from the scene. As an EMT, your role is to recognize problems, take actions for personal safety and the safety of others, and notify the appropriate authorities of the hazmat situation. We also want to remind you that we're not going to treat patients until they have gone uh, undergone decontamination, and I don't want to glaze over this. Hazmat is an entire chapter, so we'll be talking about this later on in the year. And I'm very excited to bring in a couple of hazmat professionals that I've had the uh, distinct pleasure of working with so that they can talk more about their area of expertise. Terrorist incidents, on the other hand, are a lot different than a hazmat incident or even just random violence. Terrorist incidents are going to be specific targeted attacks 
that have an agenda and the agenda is to cause as much as as much damage and confusion and terror as possible that's why we call them terrorist incidents they can include chemical agents biochem agents radiation explosive devices they can even just include trucks and knives and blunt objects at the end of the day terrorism has become such a pervasive part of ems that we will also spend an entire chapter talking about it at the end of the year rescue operations now, rescue operations as an EMT is dependent on where you work. We don't spend any time going into rescue operations in serious depth in my class because I'm training my students how to become EMTs at a general level. If you go into a rescue operation as an EMT for a fire department or for another uh, type of department, you'll probably receive additional training uh, before you start, and then you'll definitely receive additional on-the-job training. But rescue operations can be disentangling victims from, uh, from aspects of uh, crashes, rescuing them from fires, explosions, electrocutions, and more. The important aspect of rescue operations is that, again, we always take scene safety into consideration and that we don't endanger ourselves unnecessarily to help them. Everyone likes to think of the heroics of the individual that goes jumping through a plate glass window to go rescue someone from a burning building. And as nice of a concept as that is, no EMS professional goes into the job to give their life. That's not what they go out to do. We go out to save lives. And remember, to save lives, we need to be alive and, and safe and healthy ourselves. So what we can see here is an individual that is looking for safety threats on scene. And this looks like it is the potential for a hazardous materials response. You can see that the police officer here is using a pair of binoculars. They're staying well away from the uh, potentially involved aspects of the call. And they're looking most likely at the placards that you can see prominently displayed on those cylinders as well as those trailers. Again, we'll be talking more about hazmat response and hazmat awareness when we go through the uh, chapter on hazardous materials. Violence. Now, this is one that we're seeing a lot of. Violence against EMTs is typically not because, well, I just want to hurt an EMT. Normally, it's as a result of someone that is having an, in, an incredibly bad day that is unhappy with the way that things are going for them, and they are simply lashing out at the people that are ostensibly trying to help you. So how do we reduce our risk to becoming victims of violence? First, we need to wear safe clothing. This means that we don't have uh, large, uh, large hoop earrings in our, uh, in our ears that we have uh, our hair tied up in a safe place, that we're not wearing things that dangle off of our uniforms. Basically, we don't want to uh, increase grabability. We also want to make sure that our equipment is not cumbersome, that we can basically drop it and run if that is necessary. Always carrying a portable radio or some type of a communication device is also important because it means that we can call for backup and help. And understanding everyone's role is uh, a definitely important aspect as well because it allows us to more effectively approach the situation with a team-based dynamic as opposed to everybody going in and you know getting into a massive melee with a patient that doesn't want to go to the hospital. And again, we'll be talking more about that specifically when we talk about psychiatric and emotionally disturbed patients and the way that we're going to deal with them. Okay. You can see here that these two providers are responding to a home that probably didn't sound very nice on the phone to the dispatchers. They may have added a note in the MDT or uh, mobile data uh, terminal that said that uh, the patient was unhappy or that there appeared to be a violent uh a, viol a violent interaction occurring in the home. You can see that both providers are standing to the left and right of the door. This ensures that if anybody comes through the door or any projectiles like a gun, uh, like gunfire or anything else comes through the door, they will not be in the direct line of fire. They're going to wait for that provider or the, uh, those two providers are going to wait for the tenant to open the door and then they'll start dealing with them. You can also see that uh, the individual on the right has a flashlight and that can be used to disorient or temporarily blind the person coming to the door if it appears like they are wielding a weapon or taking a dangerous or uh, fighting posture. 
The other provider has one hand on what would appear to be either a, uh, a BLS kit or a drug box, and the other hand is free. You'll also notice that both of these uh, providers are wearing gloves, so they're already prepared to make patient contact as soon as they walk in the front door. While we're dealing with uh, potentially violent scenes, we want to do a couple of things. First, we want to observe. Survey your scene on the approach. Try not to announce your arrival. Don't just walk up with the uh, lights and sirens still going. You know, try to shut down your lights and sirens before you pull up in front of the house. I would also uh, advise that you look at where your ambulance is uh, located and where it's positioned so that you can uh, have a better idea of how to get in and out of the residence. We'll talk about this more in operations, but this is the concept of clean egress and ingress. I said that backwards, but we're talking about the uh, best way to get in and out. In is ingress, out is egress. We also want to look for some common indicators of violence. Obviously, we're looking for violence itself. Uh, something that looks like a crime scene, broken glass, blood on the ground uh, that doesn't look like it's from just a fall. Um, alcohol, drug use, weapons, family members that appear uh, to be taking a fighting stance or uh, maybe under the influence. Bystanders that are taking a fighting stance or maybe under the influence. The perpetrator themselves, and then of course animals. When we are dealing with violent or potentially violent uh, patients, we need to remember our three R's. Retreat, radio, and reevaluate. If the scene is too dangerous for us to effectively treat the patient, we need to retreat. We'll talk more about the concepts of abandonment, negligence, and uh, you know, basically your duty to act when we go into the legal and ethical aspects of the job. But remember, if the scene isn't safe for you, then you can't do your job. If you get hurt, sick, or killed, you're going to eventually delay patient care, and that is going to negatively impact the patient. So if the scene is not safe, we do need to retreat. Second, we'll radio. We're going to go ahead and reach out to our dispatchers or we'll reach out to whomever is going to send help. And the great part about all of our radios now, they typically have the aspect of, uh, of an emergency button. These radios are designed to go off if the button is pressed, which sends out a notification to the dispatcher that you are in distress and need help. And then finally, reevaluate. Look at the scene. Has it changed? Did the perpetrator leave? Is the perpetrator uh, uh, unconscious, unresponsive, or deceased? Is the scene no longer dangerous because the patient came to you and got into the ambulance? Whatever the case may be. If the scene is not safe, we need to have it secured by law enforcement, and that's a pretty that's that's a pretty standard way of dealing with it, regardless of where you serve in the United States. As you can see here, these law enforcement officers are uh, they're wearing their full battle rattle. They're going to go uh, do a little bit of door kicking today. When we have a potentially violent situation or a situation that is violent. We're going to bring in the professionals that deal with violence professionally, law enforcement. I want to make this abundantly clear to anybody that's watching this video. As an EMT, you're not trained in self-defense. You're not trained in weapons. You're not trained in retention of weapons or, uh, or removing yourself from a dangerous situation. If you get into a position where you are fighting someone, it should only be because that you are truly being ambushed and you are fighting for your life. It's unacceptable for us to fight our patients. We have the ability to effectively restrain them using a number of different methods, but that is the job of law enforcement to deal with non-compliant or dangerous individuals. That is in their job description. So don't start taking on the job description of somebody else because you're not getting the pay and you're not getting the protection. React to danger. Flee. Pretty straightforward. Get under uh, get under um, some type of protective uh, barrier, go behind your ambulance, stand behind the tires, get rid of any other cumbersome equipment. There's nothing that we carry that can be used against us in a way that would be dangerous if we can outrun our assailant, our medical bags, whatever the case may be. That's all stuff that can be replaced. It's not like we're dropping a gun at their feet and saying, please don't shoot. If the equipment is cumbersome, drop it. 
take cover, conceal, drive away. You literally came to the call in an ambulance that can outrun every single human on planet Earth. I don't care who you are. Leave in your ambulance. You can see here that these two providers are clearly staged, uh, staging a photo, but they're staging away. They are trying to conceal themselves so that they can observe the rest of the scene to determine the relative safety or danger to figure out what they need to do next. Also remember, if you are dealing with one of these situations, you are eyes on scene. You need to have a really strong report going over to the 911 operator or to your dispatcher so that they know what resources to send and where to send them. Now, we've gotten to the final part. This is the chapter review. We're gonna go over everything right now. Let's uh, make this quick because this is actually a very long video and I was kind of hoping to keep it brief. So here we go. Your well-being is an important concept. It is the most important concept of being an EMT. Never take safety standard precautions lightly. Each is an important decision and you'll have to do it at least once at every single call. You need to protect yourself from violent and seen hazards at all costs. You also want to protect yourself from disease. Now, violence and scene hazards are things that we can flee from, but disease, we don't really have a choice. We can't look at a patient and say, oh, too sick, too sick. We have to take care of them. We also need to remember not to be paranoid about catching disease, but take appropriate precautions. Use the brain that you have clearly started using in this class. Stress. It may be an immediate reaction. It could be delayed. It could be cumulative from a combination of your personal life and your professional life in EMS. They're all bad. Seek out help if you need it, and don't be afraid to say, I'm having trouble. Also, remember, you're gonna see death and individuals' reactions to death. Everyone is very personal in these situations. You may find that some of these patients' family members reach out to you later on in life to thank you for being there to help them understand what's going on. You are going to witness many stages you know the beginning stages of life and the end stages of life they're both very emotionally taxing moments not just for the individuals that are experiencing it and their loved ones but also for you the provider it is okay to feel like these things are becoming stressful and it is certainly okay to reach out and ask for help we also want to make sure that we treat people who are under stress with uh, compassion even if it's difficult to do so, even if their behavior is so unacceptable to us that we sit in the back of our ambulance going, I can't believe they're acting like this. Remember, everyone reacts to stress differently. It is not our place to judge. It is simply our place to treat and transport. Remember, every scene is dynamic and it can change in an instant. Your assessment of scene safety should be an ongoing process that starts the moment the call begins and ends once you hand over patient care. Also, remember to not be so focused on the patient that you lose perception of what's, of what's happening around you. If you've been in my class, you'll already know that I tell a lot of stories about the way that I've gone through my career in EMS, and you'll already know that uh, for many years I've worked in event EMS, meaning that I go to large-scale events some of them being some of the largest music festivals in the world. I have found over my career that my perception of danger has uh, gone in flux. Sometimes I'm very well aware and sometimes I'm less than aware, but patience and scenes can turn on you in an instant. Don't ever let your guard down. All right, so these are the very last questions to consider. Go ahead and answer down below, or if you're in my class, we'll discuss in our next meeting. Number one, what precautions must you take if you're dealing with a patient who has an open wound? An open wound meaning that you can see flesh below, they are actively bleeding, so on and so forth. Number two, what are some uh, coping mechanisms? What are some, uh, some tactics to deal with stress? And finally, number three, you have a patient that is refusing to believe that they have a terminal disease. What stage of grief are they in? These are all pretty easy questions and I anticipate a very robust discussion on exactly none of them because they're really easy questions, but they are important things to discuss. And that is the end of our review of chapter two, the well-being of the EMT. Thank you very much for stopping by. Again, please like and subscribe and share this with someone that you know, even if they're not in our class. 
because I think that it's a great way for us to review some of the most important aspects of being in EMS, which is us, the provider. Thank you very much. This is the Band-Aid Man OC signing out. Have a good one.